Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the Life Plan Interim Results Webinar. Um, we're getting ready to start. We have about 31 people joining right now, and I hope more will join as we go on. But uh, let's just get started with a quick introduction from me. Um, so we have, um, this is our program today. And we're going to start with Patrick Lohan, Sebastian Andreev, who will tell us about Bird Sounds Global and the Finnish bird models. Next, we'll hear from one of our PIs, Otto Vaskainen, who will present some results from the Global Spore Sampling Project. After that, another one of our PIs, David Dunson, will talk about some of the statistical work that has arisen from life plan so far. And then <clears throat> Deirdre will present the most helpful team award, as has become tradition. And finally, Dimby from Madagascar will present Team Madagascar and show us what they're doing over there. And the way it's going to work this time, um, we're doing this as a webinar. So if you have questions, as you have questions as we go on, please post them in the Q&A, not in the chat this time. The Q&A is slightly easier to manage. So there's a button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can type in your questions anytime and we'll look at them at the end of each talk if we have time and answer them. You can also look at others' questions and upvote them and like them and even answer them by commenting if you like. Okay, but that's it from me and I'm going to hand it over now to Patrick and Sebastian. Thank you, Bess. So let me share my screen uh so i hope that now you should be able to see the presentation am i right yes great uh okay so hi everyone uh my name is patrick lauha uh, and i am a phd student here uh, in the helsinki group uh, of life plan and uh today i will talk a little bit about the bird sound identification uh, in the project uh so let's start uh, with the data collection and data labeling. Uh, so as some of you might remember from last time, uh, we have this uh, Bird Sounds Global uh, online portal where our goal is to collect um, example vocalizations for all bird species in the world. So we have automatically extracted these 10 uh, candidate vocalizations uh, for each species uh, and what we want uh, from bird experts is that they uh, come here to validate uh, the, uh, or confirm that the uh, candidate vocalizations belong to the correct species and that they represent a typical vocalization uh, of that species. And this project has been going on for a while now. Uh, we have uh, collected quite many validation so so currently we have around uh, 1500 species validated uh, thanks to everyone who has part participated uh, in this project so far uh, but as you can see there are still quite many of, of almost the 10,000 uh, bird species worldwide uh, left to validate uh, and especially uh, on the right hand side, you can see the uh, continent specific validation counts. So, so for Europe, we have majority of the species already validated, but uh, then for other continents such as South, South America or Asia, especially, or also Africa, uh, there are still quite many species missing. So if you know the vocalizations of the birds of those continents or, or know some people who are experts, uh, with with the birds of those continents please spread the word and uh, visit our website and, and help us uh, collect the rest rest of the species uh, so that we can move on uh, but yeah this is the the old project that has been going on uh, now in addition we are also launching uh, another uh, portal here uh, to this bsg site uh, so it is this uh, soundscape annotation uh, portal so here we have uh, the recordings that you have uh, collected uh, in the uh, local life plan sites. Uh, we, we have here uh, 10 second uh, recordings and we are asking the annotators to tell us uh, which species are vocalizing uh, in the 10 second recording. 
and they can also uh, draw boxes here uh, around the vocalizations to show uh, which vocalizations and which parts of the spectrogram uh, belong uh, to the specific species uh, and so on. So, so here we will uh, collect uh, local data from, from local uh, life plan sampling sites. And, and this site will be opened uh, in a couple of weeks uh, on the 1st of June. So once it does, uh, please go check out our website and, and maybe uh, do some labeling uh, for, for your own recordings from your own life plan site. Uh, and now uh, maybe this would be a good time for Sebastian to introduce himself. So we have a new bird guy here in our life plan group and he will be in charge of controlling this uh, data collection through this bird sounds global. So go ahead, Sebastian. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, as I said, there is still much validation to be done. And the 1st of June, the portal opens, so I'll be in contact. I'll be spreading the word through various uh, social media sites and bird uh, magazines and so on and so forth. I'm a bird ringer and a bird watcher from Finland. And uh, also I do some bird recordings that can be found in Xenocanto. So yeah, <clears throat> you'll be hearing more from me later on. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay, uh, so maybe I could next show then what we are doing uh, with this data. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the models. Uh, so as you know, we are collecting a lot of data uh, I've planned and to be able to use that data, we have to know which species are vocalizing in there. Uh, and that's why we need models that can recognize the birds uh, from the recordings. Uh, so we are using convolutional neural networks to do the recognition for us. Uh, and I'm not going to go uh, into deep details about neural networks. Uh, but on a very, very basic level, uh, the idea is that uh, we have a lot of this so-called training data. So many, many uh, example vocalizations uh, of different bird species. And then this training data is shown to the uh, neural network model, which is a very uh, complex model with lots of parameters. And during the training phase, the, the network kind of learns to uh, extract features uh, from the input uh, recordings and then uh, perform a classification based on those features. So, so the model learns to output a list of probabilities uh, for all species that it knows uh, for being present in the input recording. And uh, we are doing this training in two phases. So in the first phase, uh, we use data from existing sources, uh, such as uh, Macaulay Library or Xenocanto. So we take uh, recordings from there and automatically extract uh, vocalizations of different species uh, from those recordings. And uh, this data we use as our training data to train the neural network. Uh, and as output, we get this global model um, that can somehow identify bird species from different recordings. But now the problem is uh, that the training data that we have used here uh, is very different uh, from the data that we are collecting uh, in the life plan. So this training data uh, is mostly targeted recordings. So someone has went out and seen a bird uh, singing on top of a tree and they have recorded that specific bird. And as you know, this is very different from the data that we are collecting in the life plan. So, so here we have those uh, autonomous omnidirectional microphones that you have set up in the forest and they uh, record everything they hear. So it can be simultaneously uh, multiple bird individuals, multiple bird species vocalizing from varying distances and also possibly vocalizing uh, uh, overlapping with each other. So the data quality is very different uh, from the training data that we have used. And because of this, uh, it might be difficult uh, for the model uh, to classify species from these life plan soundscape recordings. So now this is where the local data comes in. So now we take uh, the local data 
uh, that you have collected uh, and labeled uh, in the Birds on Global uh, portal. And we use that uh, as additional training data. So we kind of retrain or fine tune the global models that we have uh, to build uh, in an own model for each life plan sampling site. Uh, so, so we fine tune the model uh, with, with this local data uh, and this way the model kind of adapts to these local conditions. So it kind of learns how the uh, background noises and, and the sound environment sound like in, in a specific uh, life plan sampling site and, and also about the uh, local dialects that the birds might have in different locations and so on. So, so everything Everything uh, location specific uh, interesting information is learned uh, at, at this part of the training. And uh, then as a result, we get these local models. So now we have an own model uh, for each uh, life plan site uh, and that model uh, should be able to uh, recognize the species uh, very well from, from a specific uh, life plan location. Uh, and we have tried this uh, in Finland. So we built a model uh, for 100 southern Finnish bird species uh, and here are the results. So the y-axis shows the area under curve, uh, which measures how well uh, the model can uh, recognize uh, the different species. Uh, and here the blue dots uh, show uh, the performance of BirdNet, which is current state of the art uh, bird sound recognition uh, method. And here the orange dots are our global model and red dots are the locally fine-tuned model. So as you can see, the red dots are higher than the other dots. So, so the local model uh, really performs better uh, than those models that do not utilize the local data. So, so the local data uh, is, is very useful uh, for building uh, good uh, good classification models. Uh, and I have also uh, an example recording here. I, I hope that you can hear this. So let's try. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can hear this. I'll try to play it one more time. Okay, I think at least somebody heard it, great. Uh, so there we have uh, three species uh, in a 10 second recording. Uh, so we have Antus trivialis, that's the tree pipit uh, in the green boxes. Then we have common cuckoo, Cuculus canorus uh, in the yellow boxes. And then on the background, uh, we have Turdus philomelos, uh, that is song trash uh, in the purple box. Uh, and on the right hand side, uh, you can see the predictions uh, by the local model. Uh, so these are kind of probabilities for each species to be present uh, in this recording. Uh, and as you can see, the model outputs uh, quite high predictions for both of these foreground species. And it also kind of recognizes the song thrush from the background, but here the prediction is much lower so the confidence is much lower uh, because uh, the bird sings on the background and it's only one uh, call so it's uh, quite difficult to hear that from this recording uh, but for example for this recording um, i would say that the model actually works quite well okay uh, i think that's mostly it uh, the take-home message from here is that uh, we have constructed a bird sound recognition model that performs better than previous solutions. And then local data with annotations is very important for uh, training good models. So we are really hoping that uh, once our uh, global portal launches uh, on the 1st of June, uh, we get uh, many users on that site uh, and, and many annotations so that we will be able to uh, train good, uh, good models for each life plan sampling site that there is. Great, uh, thank you. Now, if we have time for questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. We have time for questions. Um, <clears throat> there was one question in the chat that I think also at least partially, and now there's another question in the chat. 
if you can see those, Patrick. Yeah, let's check the chat. Uh, yeah, what's the scale of local? Uh, so in this, uh, okay, Otso already answered that. Uh, yeah, uh, Otso's answer is correct. Uh, in this uh, Finnish tryout that we had, I think the uh, lo uh, the sampling locations were like some dozens of kilometers uh, away from each other. But but uh, in the life plan context, uh, local would basically uh, mean one sampling site. So within like, I guess, one one or a couple of kilometers would, would be that scale in, in the life plan context. Uh, OK, issues with calls or songs uh, recognition. Uh, well, of course, if if the uh, if if calls, for example, are very similar uh, for different species, then they might be uh, difficult to distinguish. So, so I would say that typically songs are easier easier to classify because they are there's uh, they are so different from each other between different species. But if a species has a very recognizable call, then of course it's not an issue to to recognize a call uh but but yeah like uh, i would say for example for cross bills uh which are the first example that i can come up with uh that uh that have like very similar uh calls they they might be difficult for the model uh but but yeah like if basically if a human uh can hear the difference between different bird species then the model should be able to do that it's only a question of the amount of training data yeah how accurate is the model uh so the area under curve uh right now is is around uh i guess it was on average uh 0 0.90 uh for different species so of course like it depends what is your accuracy measure but but in terms of auz it's like around 0 0.9 on average and yeah about the the scale of the local i guess that you could um, apply this to a whole country also uh you will just need uh representative data from the whole country then uh of course, depends on the country. Like if, if you have 200 species like we have here in Finland, it would not be a problem uh, than if you are from Southern America and have like 1,500 species per country, then, then it might be more difficult. Uh, are there any plans to look at the non-bird soundscapes? Um, yeah, actually, uh, these same methods uh, the plan is to uh, apply the same methods at least for bats and frogs, but but uh, but I mean uh, going deeper into the into analyzing the soundscapes, uh, I guess that there are no plans for that right now. Like of course we have to learn the soundscape uh, and and the background to be able to tell that that's the background that can be like ignored but but uh at least i don't know that there would be any plans to really uh, go into analyzing the backgrounds right now and yeah for brazil i would uh, i would maybe build several uh models for different locations because you have such diverse bird species there Okay, thank you everyone for your questions. I think it's time. I think thank you very much, Patrick. I think it's time we move on with the also if you're ready. All right, can you see my screen now? Yes. So I will report some results from the global spore sampling project, so GSSP. And let me remind that GSSP was a pilot project uh, prior of life plan that included the cyclone sampler only, which we then expanded to the life plan project, which also involves the other sampling methods, as you very well know. And the reason why I'm talking about GSSP here in this webinar is that 
many of the original GSSP teams are also part of life class, so I, I assume some of you are here, as I actually saw from the, from the list. And now we are finally getting close to publishing the GSSP results, so I think this will be interesting for, I hope, many of you. So what we are preparing at the moment is this manuscript on the global, spatial and seasonal patterns of the known and unknown fungal diversity with a little bit more than, than 100 co-authors, so mainly the teams who were collecting the GSSP data. And we have included in this manuscript data from 47 sites. So here you see those sites on the map. The colors of the dots, they classify these sites into these major climatic zones, so the tropical, subtropical, temperate or polar continental. And in total, we have 2,100 samples in this data, so a bit more than 50 per site, so on average about one year of sampling of weekly samples per site. And this data we have processed through a meta coding approach where we have used the fungalitis tumor marker for sequencing. And we have also applied a spiking approach so that we are able to quantify the, the amount of fungal DNA in, in the units of nanogram of DNA per cubic meter of, of air. And now the bioinformatical pipeline that combines the Amplicon sequence variants or ASVs with probabilistic taxonomical placement with the kind of constraint and dynamic clustering algorithm so that then in the end uh, we can we have also the taxonomic placements of the species level OTUs and, and especially we try to quantify, like you see here, the colors of the branches of the tree that some of these units refer to previously known taxa, that we can reliably say that they are some previously known taxa, the, the black branches. Then the red ones are those for which we can reliably say that they are taxa that are missing from the existing reference databases, so they are previously unknown taxa. And then there are these gray cases which are uncertain in the sense that we cannot reliably say whether they belong to previously known or unknown taxa. And in addition to this uh, species data that we compiled with GSSP, we utilize here environmental data, both the climatic data that represents the kind of the mean uh, climatic conditions of the sites, but also weather data, so what, what was the weather at the time of the sampling. And as we talk about uh, fungal spores in the air, as the, as the main trait, we use the, the size of the, of the fungal spores. So the, those data we extracted from the microbag uh, database. Now, if we first look at the species accumulation curves, we see that in, in this data, we had in total something like uh, 20,000 uh, fungal species. And there is basically no saturation in the species accumulation curves. If you look at the red or the green curves, which show the species accumulation as a function of increasing number of sampling sites or increasing number of temporal replicates per site. So if we, if we simply extrapolate to ask that how much sampling should we do before we saturate it, eventually, you know, to, to the global uh, estimated, predicted uh, fungal uh, species richness, we see that we might need to do even thousand times more sampling than we did with GSSP to see all of those millions of species of fungi. And now the life plan ellipse shows like how far in the sampling we are likely to get with the life plan project. Now the, now the blue curve is saturating here. That's basically showing that our sequencing depth was sufficient to, to capture the species richness that we, we had in the samples. Well, in terms of the taxonomic placement, it was possible to reliably identify about 25% of all the species in our sample to the species level so that we could give a scientific name uh, from the, uh, for, for those species that we could really trust. And, and you know, we, we could identify about 75% of the species reliably to the order level. And as you see, those red bars are a bit shorter than the other, other bars, especially at the species level, meaning that it was especially difficult to 
identify the species from the tropical subtropical samples, reflecting the the partiality of the of the reference databases, especially from from those areas. Uh, if you look at the species turnover over very large uh, spatial scales, so first like between these three major climatic regions, we see that there is a very high level of species turnover at the at the species level, so that the proportion of species that were found from all of these three climatic zones that were really the cosmopolitan species, that's, that's really small, that's the, that's the uh, brown area on the left hand side graph. But then if you look at the turnover at the level of, uh, let's say, orders, we see much less of that, that, that maybe 80% of the species belong to such an order that is present in, in all of these three. Uh, major climatic zones. And we really found that fungal communities are very strongly structured by, by both the geographic and climatic distance. And here by climate in this graph, I simply mean the mean annual temperature of that site. So climate, climatic conditions and geographic position, they are of course highly correlated, so there is a big shared proportion of variance explained jointly by these two, but both geographic distance and climatic distance also have their distinct effects that structure fungal communities. So in the ordination space, <clears throat> you, you see each site now as one dot, and you very clearly see how the how the mean annual temperature is uh, related to the positions of these uh, fungal communities uh, in the ordination space so that the tropical subtropical sites are on the right hand side and then the polar continental sites are on the on the left hand side. Here we have plotted some patterns of seasonality. So this graph relate to the DNA amount, species richness and, and community weighted mean uh, spore size. And what we see here is is that the tropical regions, they really have the highest amount of DNA and species richness, even if, if you look at, at the time of the year when, when you know, fungi are peaking in the temperate or polar continental regions, even at those, those time of the year, there is more DNA in the air in the, in the tropics so, and, and tropical sites. And if we look at spore size, we see that that is the largest in the polar continental regions, and it's slightly larger in the spring season than in the autumn season in this data. And now, if you look at in more detail about the influence of the weather conditions, so the weather conditions at the day of the sampling or the week before the prior to the sampling, we see that there was most fungal DNA in the air, especially in the, in the warm and, and windy days, so that influences the conditions then locally. And finally, uh, we conducted kind of a joint species distribution modeling analysis of the most common species in our data. So here we see some results of those 265 species that were common enough that meaningful modeling was possible for them. We asked for these species that how much, how dependent are they on climate? So that how narrow or broad is their niche in terms of the climatic conditions at which they, which they grow and, and sporulate. And also like how strong seasonal variation those species show. And we observed especially strong phylogenetic signal in the seasonality dependence that there are some groups of fungi that show really strongly seasonal dynamics. For example, I have circulated there the order polyporales, that there are many species in that order that also strongly seasonal dynamics, whereas then there are many other orders of fungi that basically don't show the species in those, so almost no, no seasonal variation. We also found a phylogenetic signal in their climatic dependency, but that was milder than in their level of seasonality. All right, I'm coming to the end of my 10 minute report. <clears throat> so what next? Obviously, we will finish this, this manuscript that I presented and, and possibly some other manuscripts from the GSSP data. But then more importantly, we hope to soon move on with similar but clearly more comprehensive analysis of the, of the life plan data that you know, many of 
you are now sampling at the time as, as, as we are speaking here. So it will be really exciting to see uh, what kind of results we will then get with that much more comprehensive data set. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosa. <clears throat> we have one question in the Q&A, if you can answer it in 30 seconds. <laughs> so it's about why it's more difficult to identify uh, tropical species. Yeah, it's basically, you know, species identification is difficult because the databases are partial. That most fungi are still unknown to science, so clearly we cannot identify them. They are present in, in our samples, but we cannot identify them. And then even those fungi that are known to science, only for a small proportion of them, then we have a reference sequence. So these are the trivial reasons why it's difficult to identify fungi. Then there are some other more kind of refined reasons on top of that. But what our results really tell is that, you know, let's complete these reference databases, let's place more species there. So, so then after that, we will be able to identify species better also from the tropical regions. Yeah, and last, last, how many sites have been included in this data set? Can you remember offhand how many? In this data that I showed, we have 47 sites. Great, thank you. We're just about on time. And um, is David ready? Yes. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. OK. Perfect. And so I'm David, and we, um, I'm sort of heading the uh, big data statistics part of Life Plan. So uh, I'll give an overview of sort of what, what we've been doing in this regard. Um, so in general, my, my team develops new ways of analyzing kind of big, complicated, structured data sets. And um, we create kind of new statistical machine learning tools for testing scientific hypotheses and learning about structure and complicated data. Uh, the, the general uh, type of approach we tend to take is probabilistic modeling or Bay Bayesian statistics, and th this is really nice in, in allowing you to kind of model structure in, for example, ecological data and, and characterize uncertainties in learning from data. So if you take often a lot of other approaches, then you, you don't have that ability to characterize uncertainty in learning structure and testing hypotheses. So we, we develop uh, very general statistical tools, but, but that, that, that would be applicable to many things, but that are directly motivated by life plan problems and data sets. And so the, uh, we, what we've been working on lately uh, can be kind of broken up in the, the following. And so we have thread one, which is kind of scaling up to big data sets, uh, scaling up models that we would like to use uh, to analyze life plan type data, but that don't scale very well in the problem size. And I'll define what I mean. And, and thread two has been more along the lines of species identification. And a new direction that we're working on right now is on ecological networks. So scaling to big data sets. Um, so ma many approaches, statistical algorithms, uh, modeling um, approaches, joint species distribution modeling has been developed in kind of smaller data contexts. And so we'd like to be able to develop methods that, that scale better. And so uh, life plan particular is collecting data on really large numbers of species, huge numbers of DNA sequences, uh, many time points, uh, many different spatial locations. And so we'd like to be able to model those data w w without having to worry about the, the, the size of the data set. Okay, so in, in that setting, there's both statistical modeling challenges and algorithm challenges. Yes. So the, the data we tend to see, they're, they're very huge and sparse at the same time, and so they're both large and small. And so you, at, as you collect more and more and more species, also showed in the Global Spore Sampling Project, he focused on you know, actually a very small proportion of those more common ones. And then you have these very, very, very large numbers of interesting species, um, but that are, that are really rare. And so you get this kind of immense uh, data size, that, but very sparse, okay? So we, we need to be able to deal with that in our analyses. So, so what have we done lately? And so we, we've made a number of pretty major advances, I would say. Um, the, the first thread is on dealing with a huge number of spatial locations. And so I have a really talented postdoc, Michele Peruzzi, also a PhD student, Bora Jin, who's been working on, on this and have written a number of papers that are very good at scaling up modeling to large numbers of spatial locations. Um, something we've worked on not as much is uh, dealing with huge numbers of time points. 
Um, but we have a paper um, you know, under revision at the top journal in International in Statistics on that problem uh, dealing with very long, long time series data. Uh, we, we've also been working on the, the huge number of species problem, and so we have a, a no, most notably a paper uh, under revision at that same top statistics journal, uh, kind of developing scalable methods for joint species distribution modeling. Okay, so here, here's some of the references. I won't go into that, but there, there's we have had, had had a bunch of papers published or under revision at top places on this. So the in terms of the species identification thread. We've also made a lot of progress. Uh, this is kind of a new, newer area for me. Um, and so we, we tend to get this kind of uh, barcoding data that I've so de 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 described for fungi, insects, okay? And we'd like to be able to automate species identification based on these kind of nucleotide sequence data. So the question one we had is, uh, you know, related to this kind of saturation problem that Atsu was talking about. Can we predict how many species are represented in a sample based on kind of partial DNA sequencing, okay? This might be very useful in deciding how, how much more sequencing we should be doing um, or providing a better predictions of the number of species in a sample based on, a, you know, finite, a, a limited depth sampling, okay? And so then we can have, well, with uncertainty intervals that are hopefully accurate, the, the number of species that, that, that would have been in the sample had we done complete sequencing. Okay, and so the question two is then, um, you know, starting with some sort of reference label taxonomy, can we add sequences to the tree while, while adaptively adding new branches? Because we're going to be discovering as we do this uh, sampling in life play out a lot of new species, and so we, we need to be adding to the tree of life uh, adaptively uh, while allowing uncertainty. Okay, and so uh, this really great PhD student, Ali Zito, has been working on both problems and has an in initial solutions. Um, and so there's this rich literature, mathematical literature, mostly also in ecology, on species sampling modeling and, and predicting species ri richness based on these types of models. And so Ali, um, you know, took, took the data from the spore, global spore sampling project, and it was really large and carefully collected and wonderful uh, data resource. And so he was able to expose some problems with usual species sampling modeling that motivated a new class of statistical models um, that he developed al along with theory guarantees for those models and also obtained very fast and easy to use code. And the paper was ju just came out um, in JASA just, just, just days ago, which is that same you know, first, uh, maybe arguably the top statistics journal in the world. Okay, and, and in terms of the question two, um, what Ali was doing was like, okay, well now we want to be able to, um, to automatically, we have this reference label taxonomy and we want to add, we want to allocate species as appropriate but add branches as needed. Okay, and so we, we developed a, a Bayes non-parametric framework for taxonomic classification. Uh, Ali calls it Bayes, Bayesant. And so it, what this does is probabilistically classifies the sequences automatically creating new branches to be added to the tree while, while including uncertainty in that decision. Okay, so we might be, oh, well, this is a 50% chance that this is a new species or new family, new genus. Okay, and, and um, again, we have easy to use, hopefully easy to use code, and the paper has just been submitted. It's also available in archive. Um, the, the final thing that we've been doing uh, lately that now, now has been really a lot of uh, something we're really, really excited about is on studying ecological networks, okay? So species interaction networks. So, uh, so a, a former postdoc, um, Georgia Papadou Georgiou at, at Wadatso, et cetera, has developed an approach that can predict interactions between birds and plants based on species traits uh, using uh, Amazon data. And so it, it allows uh, very, very importantly for the types of geographic and ta taxonomic bias typical species interaction data. And um, it's interesting, we, we've just had it up on archive, it's uh, under, under revision at Annals of Applied Statistics, but already we've had several people apply, um, contact us about trying to use the same type of statistical methods in other contexts like primate parasite nets and animal plant nets in Africa, et cetera. Uh, Jennifer Campy is a PhD student at Duke, a really good student, leading ongoing efforts in this direction. Also considering spatial variation in um, interaction networks and trying to couple uh, network data with joint species distribution modeling data, which is a really interesting problem because usually we just have co-occurrence and we don't know whether like 
species co-occur because there's actually an interaction between these species or whether they just happen to like the same environment or something like that. Okay, and so, um, so, so here's some, some references. The, uh, the paper on modeling of sequential discoveries, also with ATSO, just came out in JASA. And um, here are those other papers, and I will stop there. Thank you, David. <clears throat> we just have time for a quick question, if anybody has any. Not seeing anything in the chat or Q&A yet. He's too impressed to think of any questions. Okay, if not, then I'm going to turn it over to Deirdre, who is going to announce the most helpful team award for this time. Hi. Um, so, uh, yeah. So this this meeting for this meeting, the it's actually two teams that are most helpful team awards because um, well they work together very well and um, they um, they have gone really above and beyond in in helping the project by first of all creating a video of how to do all the sampling in the field in spanish and sharing it on youtube and they've also done a number of translations in spanish for the life plan project which means that it's uh, a lot more accessible for quite a lot of our teams so we are very very grateful to them and uh, they will be eventually receiving some of our key life plan t-shirts and baseball caps. So yeah, thank you very much to all the teams for participating because really we can't do any of this without you. Um, that's really all I have to say. Thanks, Dee. And there we see the fabulous t-shirts and baseball caps. Okay. We are still on time. Um, and I think next we're going to hear from Dimby. Dimby, are you there? Okay, let, um, let me find how to share the there should be a button at the bottom of it. There you go. Now you're screen sharing. If you can make so it. What do, do you see the, the PowerPoint? I see your PowerPoint. Can you make it full screen? Okay. Um, full screen. Present. Oops. Wait. Because I have like two screen. Wait. I think if you click presentation mode now, it should. Yes. Be. Okay. Uh, is it okay? Well, we're seeing your PowerPoint, but it's okay. 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 So, um, how about life plan in Madagascar? We have uh, 53 trap stations in Madagascar. Uh, that means 53 uh, cyclone samplers, 265 uh, cameras, and audio. So, here in Tana, we are uh, a team of eight people and in all Madagascar, we have around, we are working around with uh, 90 local assistants. And as you see on the map, uh, the sites are not distributed evenly because we can't go at some places. And uh, at some places also, there's no people to, to service the traps. And also in the west of Madagascar, uh, there are many security issues. That's why, for example, we didn't we did not continue to work with the sites from IBA because of security problem. So um, yes, so
Uh, okay, it's it's different. Uh, the screen is different from the. Ah, uh, okay. Wait, wait. Which one do you see? Okay. So you see my notes, but not the, the not the PowerPoint. We see both. Okay, and, and and on my screen it's just the PowerPoint. Okay, it's it's not a problem. It's okay. It's okay as as long as you see it. It's different. I'm working. Uh, so it should be this one. That's it. See? Now yes. No, now it's working. OK, so though we chose these sites, uh, still it's, it was quite uh, challenging to, to get to the sites. Uh, we used all means. Uh, we used cars and boats, but when the, the material were too heavy, we rent cars instead of our car, our own car, because otherwise we could break our uh, our own cars. And as you can see, we we sometimes we travel by boat. And the challenge during the installation was first the security. We had to put the cyclone samplers in cages, and also we had to to solder the the solar panel on the cage. And the cameras, we made the enclosure to protect the camera. In terms of uh, on-site implementing, um, we realized that when we were in the forest, the forest was already destroyed and we have to move uh, our sites to different location. And a part of the challenge also was the training of the, of the assistants because we we couldn't stay very long in the in the in the sites as we had to move to install the next uh, sites and that's why sometimes we had problems with the the smartphone they couldn't send the data on time because of internet so at the beginning when we start the life plan we start the life plan during the dry season and when the rainy season came we start like we saw that we have uh, camera problem and also audio morph problems, all related to humidity. And also the cyclone samplers, um, they, they stop to turn the tail, stop to turn because in the forest, they don't turn regularly. So after one or uh, two months, they, they can't, they don't turn. And in terms of security, uh, fortunately, uh, we had only one case of uh, thefts in the north. So it, this is much fewer than we expected to happen in Madagascar. And uh, the data for the, to send the internet at some place, the, the local assistants, they have to, to walk to reach uh, internet coverage. So how do we manage the 90 assistants? We call them regularly. So all the team here, they, we call the, the assistants. And the materials, the, the hard drives, uh, they travel by, hard, uh, by the taxi bus. But for the biological samples, we, we go collecting the, the samples by ourselves. Um, one thing about life plan, is the, the fact that there's a, there are many opportunities for Malagasy PhD students and research researchers. Um, and also we need to, to strengthen the relationship with the park managers and the forest ministry, because they always keep asking about what life plan and what research can do to conservation in Madagascar. And one aspect of the um, of life plan that 
one aspect that life plan can do for Madagascar is the biodiversity man monitoring with park managers. So we think that there are many possibilities uh, that we can work with the uh, with the audio of the cameras and the malice traps. All these can contribute to biodiversity monitoring. Uh, and we can work with park managers. So this is um, a very good opportunity to help park managers and to show that we contribute to, to conservation. And last, uh, we are working with many institutions in Madagascar, with the ministry, and we have a supervisory authority because we can't apply for a research permit by ourselves. And we are working closely with a park manager. And thank you. Thank you, Jimby. Um, <clears throat> there's one question in the Q&A from Agnes Kreling. Um, is there a life plan site in Andasibe? Not really in Andasibe, but uh, next to it. In the, in, the, in the region, yes, but not exactly in Andasibe. Do we have any more questions from anyone? We still have time for a few questions. What questions about anything else that came up during the during the webinar? Brian raised his hand. Do I have to give you permission to speak? <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me now, but I I, yeah. I wanted to just add a few points um, to. Uh, Dimby's last couple of slides, which really touch on not just um, the mechanics and the kind of the, this project has evolved into an IT project in a sense, managing and fixing uh, audio moths and, and cameras, but it's also how international science can be conducted um, uh, now in, in the current settings. And I think what Dimby was mentioning was more about how um, more, Western-centered science bases can actually make sure the knowledge and power are shared, shared equally um, and developed in host countries, if you look at that way. So it's something to continually think about in this project is how um, science can be conducted now post, you know, want to think about it post-colonial, um, where equity is important and, and knowledge and power sharing is important. So that's just an important theme that we should all be thinking about and it's a growing importance in international science. Yeah, if, if I continue a little bit on that, that was an excellent uh, remark that you made, Brian. And of course, you know, one, one key aspect of the collaboration is that, uh, that we are producing together these scientific papers where people will co-author, but it's, it's not only that that we are doing. And then, then these, uh, <coughs> these, these other aspects of benefit sharing, for, for example, these, these uh, educational aspects are, are super important for us and there are some some projects where we are involved in for example the supervision co-supervision of, of master thesis or phd thesis with the, with the sampling teams and that's also something that i want to everybody to remind that if you are interested in in such aspects of collaboration and we are of course very very open open and happy to to take part to them so just be in contact and and then we see what what we what we can do together in in, in that that sense okay any other questions if not then we're actually going to finish early for once so thank you very much to all the panelists and thank you for to all the attendees for coming and uh, the recording will, as usual, be posted on our website um, tomorrow and it will be found there. Thank you and goodbye.